we come to our uh, next presentation. So um, our, our next speaker, um, Robert Altinger, is a highly experienced technology leader who has led distributed teams of more than 400 people across the globe. He spent 15 years spinning up startups in the, U uh, in the US, Europe, and Asia Pacific. Um, he's currently the Senior Vice President of Acquisition and Integration at ESW Capital, and he will present um, some of the further ideas on um, how we can um, build that, um, yeah, the, how, we can, how you can be the solution in engineering. Sorry, I think I messed up the talk. So one thing which I want to mention also before, please come on stage. Thank you, so, Robert. Okay. Thanks, guys. I'm not going away. I need to still give one quick announcement. I'm just wondering about the noise. Yeah. Yes. Okay, cool. So one quick announcement that I want to make for those of you who were not yesterday. We have Q&A session. So Robert is going to be the first speaker today who is going to be available on the Q&A session. So you can go to slido.com, enter TechSylvania 2018 as a hashtag, select the speaker such as Robert, send him any kind of questions. And after this talk, he's going to be available on the Q&A stage. So, but you can post this question from your phone during the talk. And then people can vote on the questions. And then you'll answer all of these questions in a little bit more uh, private setting in the Q&A stage. OK. Very good. With that, Thank you. I'll hand the stage to you. Thank you very much, Thank Robert. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. Bona dimenaza, Texylvania. Hey guys, I'm, I'm happy to be here. My name is uh, Robert Altinger, and Philip's done a pretty good job of introducing me. Uh, I came here today, uh, and I was told just to find something to talk about. And so I've decided to talk about the essence of engineering and why it's imperative for engineers uh, today to be the solution. So first, I'd like to give it some historical perspective. Engineers have been around for a very long time. Uh, when we, eh, let's go really far back. When we started the agricultural revolution around 8,000 BC, engineers invented things like the wheel and the plow and made that all happen. So this is essentially how society was. Engineers basically were taking orders from rulers and basically this lasted from about 8,000 BC to around 1648. In 1648, something interesting happened. The birth of nation states at the Treaty of Westphalia essentially created the concept of a country uh, where treaties were now between France and England instead of King Louis and King Henry. And th this was a major societal change and gave rise to the political classes, politicians, democracy, and many other things, also the Industrial Revolution. And this is more or less where we find ourselves today. But today, we are on the cusp of another major revolution of a similar magnitude, which is the information revolution. Today, we're seeing the birth of transnational entities, like my own firm, Crossover, uh, which basically doesn't care where people are. They just basically break down national barriers. So today, we're also seeing engineers moving more into the centers of power and decision making. More engineers are in the boardroom than ever before, and they're basically leading the world and, and trying to actually implement the essence of engineering uh, to guide us in this transformation and the stage that we're seeing. Today, we're basically winning the war that has been going on for thousands of years between the hackers and the suits. A point that I'd like to make, this is the old slides, guys. Um, a point that I'd like to make uh, is uh, basically in, in dealing with the, the reality for innovators is that you guys need to realize only 2% of people actually do stuff, right? 8% of people watch the 2% and try to claim the credit, and 90% of people are still on the couch eating popcorn wondering when the next episode of Desperate Housewives is coming out. The reason that the US is still leading the world in engineering innovation is not because they have better engineers. It is because they are willing to take risks and fail. And if Europe is ever going to catch up, it needs to improve the way it does this. So 
engineering innovation can come in many forms. Historically, some unknown Mongolian engineer invented the stirrups, which totally changed his world. He basically invented the concept of cavalry and the ability to use the horse and warfare. It was all revolutionized. And yet, the actual innovation is just a hoop of steel. Steel itself is an innovation, a material innovation, which changed everything from weapons in the early days to after mass production of steel, uh, skyscrapers, railroads, and so forth and so on led to the Industrial Revolution. But engineering innovation can come in many different forms. One form which I'm particularly fond of is process innovation. Henry Ford uh, invented mass production in the early 19th century and basically democratized the car and changed the face of the world by doing so. Today, the pace of innovation has massively accelerated. Vinton Cerf, in the late 60s and 70s, invented TCPIP, which is the basis for the information revolution which we use today. But it was used primarily by engineers until this guy, Tim Berners-Lee, came along and basically democratized the internet by creating the web. Interestingly, this was almost an accident because he was just trying to share research papers amongst his colleagues at CERN, and he only realized the implications of the invention of the web afterwards. But it was a dramatic change, and the pace of innovation is increasing still further now. This guy, actually it's not this guy, we don't know who he is, okay? But Satoshi Nakamoto invented blockchain in 2008. And the key innovation here is not Bitcoin. The key innovation here is the lack of a need for a trusted third party. Today, we can do contracts based in code and not based on having a legal system that we can sue people and notaries who can stamp stuff. The full effects of this innovation have not yet been realized. And it is, it's, we're still in the process of actually understanding what it is. And many of you, I know, are working on these technologies and should continue to do so. This is a, this is a major, major change. And yet it's not the biggest change that's facing us today. Today, AI is probably the biggest change that we're seeing. AI is moving quietly into every area of human endeavor. We're starting to see bankers getting replaced by AIs. We're starting to see trading getting replaced by AIs. We're already seeing robots and everything else building our factories and so forth and so on. And we're starting to see AI actually do the testing for your code. So AI is pushing into multiple different areas. And the people who are guiding those areas and making sure that they're done in, in a correct way are engineers. So it's very important to actually take responsibility. As Spider-Man has taught us, with great power comes great responsibility. And engineers need to be the solution because engineers are the best hope for solving the problems of the future. I'm going to skip that slide, and I'm going to go to this one. <laughs> OK, so a former colleague of mine, Nathan Mervold, was actually on CNN a while ago talking about global warming. And Fareed Zakaria was saying, you know, the United Nations is planning to do this global law thing where we're going to prevent people from burning stuff when they're cold. And Nathan said, you know, that's never going to work. If you're freezing in Siberia, and there's a law that the United Nations passed that says you can't burn something, you are totally going to ignore it. So <laughs> it's never going to work to try and solve a problem like global warming through legislation. The solution, according to Nathan, was to take 12 weather balloons, a very long garden hose, some canisters of SO2, <laughs> and basically pump SO2 into the jet stream at a certain point, which he figured would actually reduce global temperature by a full degree, giving us 150 years to figure out how to get rid of the carbon. Fareed didn't know what to say. I don't think that is the solution. But I think it's more likely to be a solution that an engineer will solve the problem of global warming by doing something about the root cause than it is that a politician is going to solve it by passing a law. And this is the point. The great problems of the world need to be driven by engineers, as we have done throughout history, to actually solve stuff. And it's important that we actually take on the challenge and do it. So this guy, Elon Musk, is basically solving a problem called peak resource, or trying to solve a problem called peak resource. 
I have economist friends who talk to me and say, you know, we've used half of the oil in the world, we've used all of the copper in the world, the lithium is running out, and our children are going to have to learn to love to eat insects because we just won't be able to feed them otherwise. Because we have all these charts that show that the problem is insoluble. And engineers have never believed that. John Malthus in the 1600s said that the world population could not exceed 5 billion because of our food productive capacity. Okay, until engineers invented the combine harvester and all the other things that increased the yield to the point where people today are better fed than at any time in their history. So engineers never accept these challenges or these limitations and they push forward. I would not want to be this guy's investor. Okay, he is using all the money that they're giving him to do really wacky innovation to push us into space. Falcon Heavy has reduced the price of actually launching something into space by tenfold, okay, due to reuse and smart use of engineering. And this is great. Serious uh, in engineers like Larry Page and Sergey Brin and, and this guy are basically pushing the boundaries and they're doing it with private investment. If we could basically focus on this, we can solve peak resource as well as global warming. And that's a, a very important thing to do. So what I'd like to leave you with is three credos, if you will, that I have learned over the years of my experience in engineering. The first one is, whatever you work on, the solution has to work. Now that sounds like a platitude, but there's maybe 50 ways to do something that all work, which is fine, but there's a thousand ways that don't work. Don't waste your time doing things that don't work. The second point is that the solution should have engineering elegance. What is engineering elegance? At its heart, engineering elegance is simplicity in the solution of the long-term problem. You can solve something even more simply if you're just focusing on the short term, but you should be solving the long-term problem as simply as possible. The best innovations and the best stuff actually are simple. There are things that people say, why didn't I think of that? That's easy. That's the kind of stuff that people should be focused on when they're doing their thinking about innovation. And the third point, which I think is also very important, is that the job is not done until we are all drinking beer. We should be continuously, continuously trying to improve the solution so that we can harness that 90% of people who are sitting on the couch so that they can do the stuff without having to apply innovation and creativity every time in a repeatable process. You guys should work on it until it's automated and it just does itself and you are sitting there admiring the magnificence of your engineering solution. Some people say, if you do that, you work yourself out of a job. Gosh, I've made my job so simple, anybody can do it. Believe me, believe me, in this world, Somebody who can solve stuff so that anybody can do it will have somebody knocking on his door in five minutes with an even larger, gnarlier problem to solve. The people who know how to solve stuff are rare. They're you guys. You guys need to solve the problems. And I believe that in this attitude and this, this, this way of thinking, we can basically help solve the problems of the world okay, by focusing on what we do best. So I'd like to thank you very much. I'm going to leave it there. I'm a little early, but uh, I had to improvise my slides. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Thank you, guys. Well, that's that's hell of a payback because <laughs> as you're five minutes early, I have to see if we are ready with like the next thing. Okay. So well, I, have to, I have number. to. Ella could dance for us. Hmm? No, no, no. I, I, I challenge you to one thing because yep. you make my life hell. I'll make yours hell. Okay. So I know that you're like a great joke teller from yesterday evening. <laughs> so since you have five minutes extra, do you want to tell this audience a joke? Can so. I tell the audience a joke? Yeah, I'll tell a joke. And I swear this was not prepped. I'm just putting him on the spot here. So. Okay. I'll tell a joke. I'll tell a joke about engineering because this is the topic of the conversation. And I've already told this joke, so you've heard it. But that's why I can read the next speaker and see if he's ready. Okay. So, a doctor, an architect, and an engineer, to be specific, an IT engineer, 
are arguing about what is the oldest profession in the world. And the doctor says, well, it's medicine, because when Adam had the rib removed to create Eve by God, that is surgery. So obviously medicine is the first thing that happened, and basically surgery, doctors, medicine is the oldest profession. And the architect said, no, I beg to differ. In the beginning was chaos, and we had to create order. And when God said, fiat lux, let there be light, and actually created order from the chaos, this is the function of an architect, the architect. <laughs> so therefore, architecture is the oldest profession. And the IT guy just laughed and drank his beer and said, somebody has to put the chaos there in the first place. And that's our job. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. You You're saved welcome. you saved me. So now I definitely owe you a beer. I'll take this one here. Please. Good, because it's now we're ready with the next uh, speaker and you got to hear a joke. So if you want to hear more of that, go to work with like Robert as the crossover and he'll tell you a joke every day. Um, so that was that was good. So thank you very much.